pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next is introduction to board members. To my far left, we have Paul Amatucci, Jerry Grayville, Don Gianarelli, myself, Michael LaRue, Phil Roy, and Les Bogwell. We also have James Bellissimo, the town manager, Irish Griffith, the code enforcement officer, and Leah Rachin. You got it. All right. Well done. Town attorney mm -hmm. from Drummond and Whitson. All right, so we are going to be going into executive session. So we're going to be going in the conference room. Okay. I would just suggest of being a lawyer here. I gotta earn my keep just to say pursuant to one MRSA four oh five, okay. just so it's yes. for the record. Pursuant to one MRS section four oh five six E. Got it. That's it? I think to consult with the town attorney regarding the... Okay, to so say the whole thing? I, just just to say which application okay. everybody knows. Okay, to consult with legal counsel regarding the board's legal rights and duties in connection with a pending application by the Kevin and Rena Patel Revocable Trust for a stop-and-go gas station to be located at 355 Portland Street, map R70, lot 12 in the RCI zone. No, it's not. That's okay. Okay. I'll lead the way. We'll go to the next one. Yep. Yeah. We'll be back. Yeah. I don't know. Did Good. Yeah. Did I close it? You actually vote on it. I didn't see you yeah. read it. Do we have to vote on it? Yeah, you should. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure that you vote. Oh, okay. James is leading the way. Anyway. James. So I'll make a motion that we go to executive session. Yes. I will second. Okay, further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. All right, wait, who seconded? I did. So, thank yep. you. So do we have to make a motion to open this I or close the, the I session? I think you can come out of executive session, yeah. Okay. And note the time. All right. Do we well, we were out at, never mind. We were out at 741. 741? I make a motion that we close the executive session. Do I have to read it all out? No. Okay. All right. Less seconded. Second. Further discussion. All in favor? Aye. All right. So we're missing Paul. In Paul's in the bathroom. Okay. I'll wait for Paul. That's yours. Yeah. This is my pile right here. Yeah. Great. I'm over in the corner. Actually, this is mine. Ours. For us to share. Ours. Sharing is caring, James. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm back. All right. Old guy broke. <laughs> so, moving along, there's no public hearing. I'll open up the first public comment for non-agenda non items. <coughs> Where would I speak on an agenda, the agenda item? It's a good question, because the public hearing has been closed. Now the only discussion is between our town attorney, the board, and the developer. Is that correct? Yeah, if that's how you usually conduct your business. That's how we usually yeah. do. Yeah. Okay. No one moving forward to we'll close that public comment. Approval of minutes for May 2nd, 2024. I will note that I found an error. Um, I just found a typo. Um, first page coming down a little bit. This one, two, three lines after the public hearing. Gary St. Peter of 342 Diamond Hill Road. There's no D on it. Don't say it around. Dumb on. Dumb on. Other than that, I didn't see anything else. Good catch. Thank you. 
I'll make a motion that we accept the minutes uh, as written with the one edit. I will second that motion. Okay, for the discussion, all in favor? Aye. All right. Moving along in new business, 3G's industrial development, Portland Street, conditional use, and site plan review, R72, lot 17, zone RCI. Good evening. Uh, my name is Neil Raposa. I'm a civil consultant uh, here on behalf of uh, 3G's Realty. Uh, this is a modification uh, to a previously approved site plan um, back in uh, back in 2021 or 2000, I think. Uh, we submitted for uh, marijuana grow facilities uh, with several uh, different buildings, uh, all separated uh, on the same lot, um, and they were all going to be the same uh, marijuana grow use, except for. I guess I'm trying to see this. <coughs> Except for two of these buildings out here, uh, which were within the uh, restricted radius of another marijuana-based uh, uh, Operation that so they were precluded from the uh, from the marijuana marijuana growth. Uh, since then, it has uh, come to be that the appetite for the for the marijuana growing uh, in lease spaces wasn't what the, the developer thought it was going to be. Uh, so we're here today to uh, modify it to uh, all light industrial buildings. Uh, so it all be light industrial uses uh, with condominiumized buildings. Uh, it's gone from 12 individual buildings to nine uh, to accommodate more uh, more traffic, vehicular traffic around the site, uh, and as well as uh, be able to handle the uh, new water supply system, which will be individual wells for each building. Um, so if you want to look at this, at this new layout here. You said individual wells for each building? Correct, yep. Okay. It's, it's, um, we wanted to set it up so that that would be the option. Uh, if everybody wanted to have their own well, uh, there is capacity and setbacks for wells for everyone. Uh, if it comes to the fact that owners make an agreement and want to do a shared well or something like that, that would be something that would have to be handled uh, you know, with them and outside, outside this site plan. So. Okay. Uh, so it's a uh, similar setup. The change, uh, there's no change to the footprint at all or the stormwater management or any of that. So it's a simple notification to DEP that it's happening. Uh, so it's, it's a fairly simple, straightforward change. Um, there's really not a whole lot to present for this one. So I'll just take any questions you might have and go from there. You said individual wells. What about septics? Uh, the septic will continue to be um, the uh, combined septic field that was designed uh, for the previous uh, for the previous development, uh, and that has been uh, installed. And if need be, we do have uh, a design for an expansion that will handle the full build out. So, but you have less building. Correct. Yeah, okay. less building. And we have also uh, discussed uh, with the DOT uh, the change. And they were satisfied with our uh, traffic assessment that it would be a similar use, I mean, a similar uh, generation, and they were uh, they were okay with the permit as is. Sir, on your uh, tax map page, it shows on site location number 17, it, it appears there's a, a stream or, or some type of waterway going through. Could you point out where that's at in relation to the structure? Yep, um, that is down through here. Okay. So that's this is this is showing the setback uh, from that stream okay. as we come through. So yep, we we were uh, made yeah we were careful not to impact that with okay. with the you, previous sir. development. Yeah. And, and with regard to light industrial, it, <coughs> what, what kind of industrial activity do you foresee, in, you know, taking place in that? It's uh, the intention is to be similar to um, the uh, one use that is out there now that got uh, that got approved as a change from uh, the original marijuana uses, which is cabinetry, light woodworking, <coughs> you know, kind of HVAC outfits, uh, you know, those type of light industrial, uh, low impact, low impact manufacturing uses. So if there was something that was going to vary from that, 
um, we're you know we let them know that it's going to have to come back in for a change of use. It's going to vary from those. So like contractor type A's. Yes, yeah, like contractors. Thing. Yeah, contractor uh, shop type things. Yeah. So any businesses that would go into these, you're going to be leasing these to potential businesses, correct? The, Am I the uh, well, the intention is to condominiumize uh, commercial condos. Okay. Uh, so there would be the option for uh, the developer to be either leasing those out or sell them outright. So. So any business going in there would, would have to come before the board before they went in there or no? Um, I, I believe as long as it fell directly into the uh, low impact manufacturing definition, um, then it wouldn't have to come back for a change. But in this case, if it was something that varied from that, we let them know that they'll have to come back in front of the board to... It'd be basically just like the downtown over here. So okay. if, if it meets those standards, then they wouldn't have to come in. But if there's anything more, okay. then it would. Right? Yep. 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 Excellent. <coughs> Any other questions? Concerns? And uh, you know how many of these are built already? There's just one uh, one structure is built at the moment, and that's the um, the northernmost one here. Yep. And so that uh, the entry drive was put in to gravel, uh, then gravelled out to, uh, out to that building, which is still being that one building four on the on the site plan here, and there hasn't been any pavement uh, or parking laid out around that yet. So. It will eventually be paved. Correct. Yeah. He did at the beginning. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, yeah, and currently that's um, this wet pond here that's shown proposed, that is installed because that is, um, that's the BMP that was handling all the flow that's in the, the developed area currently. So, and that's, that seems to be uh, performing very well. We've done inspections on that one and it's been, it's been handling the storms and uh, as far as, as far as all the usual checks we do, it's, it's performing as intended, so. So basically you're looking for an amendment to reduce the number of buildings and change the use to a category of use. Correct, yep. <laughs> so I'll make a motion that we approve this conditional use. I'm going to find the application complete I'll first. Complete. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll make a motion that we find this application complete. I'll second that. Okay. For the discussion. All in favor? And you can determine if a public hearing is necessary and then move to approve if you want to waive. All right. Uh, well, let's discuss this. Do you, do you guys feel that we need a site walk and public hearing for this? Because it's just for conditional use. I think we've been, walk for the we've been out there twice. Yeah. 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 I guess the only thing I would want to just to have the discussion is if, if a business went in there that was, you know, heavy hazmat, <coughs> heavy chemical type stuff, I just don't want us to green stain. They, they would be coming to us. They would be. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just. That, that would not fall under the light in the. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That's so right. There's a, a low impact manufacturing definition. That's a pretty exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There's about. Yeah. I'm happy. So thank you. I'm so happy. I'm happy. Of course. Okay. My man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll make a motion to approve this. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Moving into old business, stop and go Berwick, 355 Portland Street, conditional use, R70, lot 12, zone RCI. So should I um, bring up that issue now? Okay, so we'd like to invite anyone to come speak. We've heard about issues about bias, so if anyone has anything to speak about, we'd like them to come up now. Can you clarify who? Clarify. Can you clarify who can come up and speak? Um, so who can speak is the applicant, 
Yeah, I think I think usually um, any concerns around bias are generally from the applicant because they're the ones who want to make sure that they're getting a fair and impartial, um, you know, determination. <coughs> so I think there have been some whiffs of allegations. There was a letter where I think the attorney had mentioned that they wanted to hear on the record that folks weren't biased, but I think it's fair to say that. Um, you shouldn't have to respond to something in isolation or just generally speaking. If there's an allegation or a concern, then it should be raised and you can address it. On that topic, there is a, a bit that I have that was brought up at on the May 2nd meeting that I'll briefly touch on. Um, but we've all, you, I believe you've all received the statement that Brian wrote. We're not, we're not seeking any direct action against any of you. You know, you're all here in the best interest of the town. You care about things getting done right. We're not asking anything from you guys. As long as you all remain partial, that's all we're asking. Um, we, you, you, do, we, do we need to wait for anything else on as far as that or bias? All right, great. I think just, I think just make it clear that we've given, uh, given the applicant the opportunity to. Uh, to speak to any potential bias they may think that there is on the board. You have what you have our opinion on the record. Thank you. Thank yep. You. Um, so, a couple of quick things that I want to address before we get to our exact submission. Um, I very, very briefly want to address uh, Southburg Water District, who is here presently, um, went with Pat Bovair, also here, to Southburg Reporter and had an article written about our project. Not a very flattering one. Not a very flattering one, but there's some things in the article that I just wanted to very quickly address, just to, just to mention. Um, so, the first thing is they talk about it's a very sensitive area. We need to do more than just meet the minimum standards. We should use the highest possible standards to reduce risk of contamination. That was mostly a quote from Ryan Leach. We've been over all of South Park Water District and Wright Pierce's assessments. While we agree that it is a much more sensitive area than your run-of-the-mill site, I want to remind everybody, Maine DEP does not find this to be a sensitive site by any of their metrics. Um, Additionally, just to speak to the factualness of this article, it mentions that the, Bur the plan was introduced by the, to the Berwick Planning Board by Wayne Page and Ken Wood of Adder Engineering. My name is not Wayne, my name is Wyatt Page. Ken Wood never once attended a meeting for this project. And um, this is not leveled at any of the board members. I just want to get it out there for the sake of what's factual and what isn't. Additionally, it states, 10 of Butters and Residents, and this is a direct quote, 10 of Butters and Residents spoke at a November 16th public hearing, more than half of them with concerns about water quality. I brought my written notes from that public hearing today. I kept a tally. It was not more than half of those members. We also, I believe, and I'm open to anyone correcting it if I'm wrong, I believe we've addressed most of the concerns from that first public hearing. We've certainly tried our very best to. You can see examples of this on the plan, with our electric vehicle chargers and more. We've really tried our best to work with the abutters here and give them as much as we possibly can to make everybody happy. Um, additionally, from the prior meeting, um, so it was questioned at one point whether or not, uh, or not by any members of the board, but it was questioned at one point whether or not we have met section 9.8.i.m stating that we will prevent water pollution. And I would like to remind everybody that town review indicates that we have everything that you guys have asked of us, meaning the board, everything that you've asked of us on this matter, we have tried our very best to respond to. We have a lot of documents that we've given you that we will talk about today um, that I hope address this thoroughly. And I really do encourage you, any concerns you have about this, bring them up, ask them of us, put it on the record, and we'll try our best to respond. Um, there was a statement that um, had some of these letters from Southburg Water District and Wright Pierce uh, been made before the project was submitted that it, people would agree it would jeopardize our drinking water. And I would like to point out for the record this project that this parcel was purchased from a member, a former member of the Board of Trustees of Southburg Water District. They knew. 
action didn't come until later, but people did know about this ahead of time. And I know in particular, Mr. Roy had some major concerns about continuity of things. So I just wanted known South Burke Water District did in fact know about this project all the way back when the parcel was purchased. Um, okay, when was the parcel purchased? I believe yeah, that. Been, uh, uh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I also, Mr. Roy, I, yes, I all everything that you had said. There was a lot of discussion about the meeting minutes. I appreciate your pursuit of clarity. I really do. Um, for the record, I do my homework. I go over the videos of the meetings. I review the meeting minutes. Um, I very much so agree, more is better. And I believe it was one of the board members here that said more is better. The more that we get on the record, the better. I, I reference my notes to make sure I have everything right. I very frequently email members of town admins, not just in this town, but everywhere, to try to make sure that all the facts are recorded, that everything is accounted for. And I encourage you to keep strong minutes. Additionally, I sent an email to James and the town admin, we talked about this briefly, the town meeting videos truncate at the three hour mark we lose all the footage after that three hour mark which horribly inconveniently for all of us cuts off the conclusion of the prior meeting that we were on the agenda for I have very diligent notes I believe James commented on my notes briefly in email stating that he thought it mostly covers everything but I want to be clear, we in no way are trying to have anything that was discussed, anything that we agreed on left off the record. We want everything to be on the record. And I really do mean that. Um, what else is there? Um, I do want to state for the record that, and I understand Leah has her recommendations. I didn't necessarily find the striking of that one conversation from the record appropriate, but that's not for me to decide. Um, yeah, you weren't here for that meeting. That um, was, was the last meeting. I was yeah. puzzled by that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I also did want to point out we had three big deliverables at the end of the last meeting we were agendized for. These have been repeatedly referred to as conditions. They are not, however, conditions of approval. Conditions of approval have to be voted on by the members of the board. No votes were taken on any of these three matters. And I believe we've addressed these matters quite thoroughly. We will get to that shortly, I promise. Um, I'm not here to browbeat anyone, but there were still lots of mentions of coincidences and other things. It's, it's an odd project, I know. And I, like I said, you have our opinion on the record. We don't have any concerns with any of you. We just ask that you, you know, everyone try to be objective here. And while, while we're on the topic, um, the video from the site walk, I have not been able to find it. I have looked for it. I too am a little puzzled as to why this meeting is not available. It seems people reviewed it. It seems even action was taken based on the contents of this video, and yet I can't find it to review myself. So I, I asked that question about that, yes. and I was sent an email from James with a link to where it is. It Excellent. is not easy to find because it okay. is listed in a video at the beginning of one of our meetings, not separate as a site walk like the other ones. Thank you. So you actually have to watch that particular date's planning board meeting video, mm -hmm. and you will see the site walk at the beginning. And I can, or James, one of us can send you that link. At risk of sounding like a broken record, does that, I assume, factor into the already limit of three hours that we may that very I, well be at I, risk I, of I going over know. tonight? No, no, there's no, that, that's not an issue anymore. Okay, awesome. That's, I'm very glad to do that. Thank you. Um, there is also, last thing about the, the, the prior meeting that we were not agendized for, um, or I guess the last two things. Uh, the first of which is we have given you folks a memo on where we fall as far as the new performance standards go. More than one person at this meeting, and I will not name names, mentioned that this project would not be approved if it were brought before the board after these new performance standards go out. And I encourage everyone to review the memo. I encourage everyone to review the performance standards. Um, and for the record, as far as the size of our project, uh, to quote Les, uh, it's not larger than Dysart's. And I believe it was also pointed out um, 
that. I actually said that. Thank you. Said. <laughs> thank you. I, I, thank you for the correction on that one. Um, and it might, may also have been you that pointed out that as far as scale goes, the Berwick Cumberland Farms has more gas pumps than, than we do. That was less. That, that was, was less. All right, I had those crossed up. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, there is, this is the only thing that I'm going to name call for is that Phil had said, and I'm going to read this quote directly, the public has confidence in our ability to try and instill checkpoints on projects of this magnitude, and again, and I quote, so that we don't get steamrolled because people want to come in and exploit loopholes in our policy. And I just want to state, we're not looking for loopholes here. We want to do everything properly, and I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I'm not taking that as an accusation. I understand that's a general statement. Such, sir. Any, anything I say here is fair game. So yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, all right. All right. I think that covers everything from the prior meeting. So back to it then. Um, first things first. We have been meeting at great length with South Berwick Water District, and they raised one particular concern that I really want to address immediately, and that was they have great concerns about the potential for spills during our night hours. Our operating hours are 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. They raised some concerns for what happens should there be a spill in between those hours. Now, Mr. Patel made the executive decision on this. He reviewed with our petroleum engineers. He reviewed with our experts. And I'll be candid with you, we actually did not like, as applicants, what we found for the procedure during those hours. And as a result, we are now offering that this is no longer going to be a 24-hour gas station, uh, or sorry, this gas station is no longer going to provide petroleum for 24 hours. We are now limiting our hours of operation from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Gas will not be dispensed during nighttime hours, specifically in the interest of making sure that any surface spills may be attended to while there is an AB certified operator present on site. <sighs> okay. Um, anyway, now on to uh, what our outstanding items were from the last meeting. I believe we had three things that we're at, we were asked to tend to. The first of which is very thoroughly covered in our cover letter. Jerry had given us some documents for, from Maine DEP, uh, specifically the requirements for unattended fueling and signage. Ironically enough, there won't be much unattended fueling going on now, but we still addressed it all the same. Um, and then additionally, the Maine DEP Maine Gas Stations Model Facility Guide. I'm not going to reread what I submitted in that memo. You're more than welcome to ask questions if you have any, but I believe we're fully in compliance with all of these, and it is our fullest intent, if that is shown to not be the case, to amend whatever we must to be in compliance with these documents. These are not recommendations. These are requirements from Maine DEP, and we take them very seriously. All right. Um, so that was one of our recommend, one of our requirements. The other, which I'm sure you all have a ginormous stack of papers in front of you as a result of, was we did get you a memo from uh, some Arden Sons going over all of the components that we wish to use. I know Jerry had specifically asked if we would have anything from Vita Root, and we have several parts from Vita Root. Additionally, I've been told by Kevin that Vita Root in particular now offers, through the wonders of technology, the ability for us to monitor the tank alarms and warnings and monitoring systems on our phones. So not only will Kevin be directly dialed in to any monitoring from the gas station at all times, so too can his employees be. So we, we really, and I know there's, a, there's literally 101 pages in that Samaritan Sun submittal. I understand if there's, you know, stones that remain unturned, but I encourage you if you have concerns about parts to go through it. Our petroleum engineers have made themselves available for inquiry. Even just today, uh, Dan Flagg from Wright Pierce had raised some questions about one of the conditions that we'll be discussing shortly that was requested by South Berwick Water District. We got a same day answer from our petroleum engineers clarifying um, the, uh, I believe it was the, uh, the status of some joints and pipe fittings that are inside of the sump. We got a same day answer on that. If you guys have equipment questions, shoot them over to us. We'll give it to our petroleum engineers ASAP. 
Um, so that was our second deliverable was that memo from our petroleum engineers. Um, the third deliverable, which I imagine will be a point of discussion, is we were asked to negotiate testing standards with South Burke Water District. And I just want to paint some context here that when you when the board was trying to decide on what our what they would be looking for us um there was a lot of debate on this point the board had some difficulty agreeing amongst themselves what constituted appropriate testing standards we as applicants had our own opinions south burke water district had their opinions and the board asked if we would be willing to let south burke water district briefly speak on the matter and then asked if we'd be willing to directly liaison with them to negotiate these testing standards we agreed unequivocally what we ended up getting from South Berwick, while it definitely does talk about testing standards, goes well above and beyond that scope. And I just want to point out, we are entertaining requests that don't involve testing standards, but unsurprisingly, the ones that we disagree on fall outside of that scope. Um, uh, all right. So. As for where we stand with South Burke Water District, they gave us seven conditions, which I'm gonna, I have to read off for the sake of discussion. The first one being that they're asking that a triple walled underground storage tank be installed for this project. <coughs> Unsurprisingly, we disagreed with them on that matter. There are outstanding tasks from both parties before this can be resolved for better or worse. These outstanding tasks, just for the sake of clarity, are we have to consult with our team, which I have been working on specifically to come up with the price differential to go from a double wall tank to a triple wall tank for the record we're not opposed to a triple wall tank going in but unless someone can find a genuine requirement for why that would be necessary which i will remind even in cases where main department or the main dep requires a variance to even have a gas station on site truly sensitive sites by all accounts a triple wall tank is not required. Furthermore, I still have not found any, nor has anyone found any instance of triple wall tanks, triple wall, yeah, triple walled underground storage tanks being in use in the state of Maine. And I am, and but so as far as we're still working on, we're, we're sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, we're willing to install a triple walled tank, but we're not willing to cover the cost difference unless you can point to a real reason or anyone can point to a real, you know, required reason why we should have to do that. Um, so while we are willing to install it, we do have to come up with, uh, we've, I, we've been quoted as saying, and I'll repeat this quote, that our, for our contracted petroleum engineers say it's astronomically expensive. We still don't have the exact price differential for you, but I do assure you we are, try we are working on trying to get an exact number so we can at least quantify the scale of this change. Um, Susan Bro of Maine Department of Water Protection um, expressed that she was not as familiar as she would like to be with the nuances between double-walled and triple-walled tanks and said that she herself would check in with Maine DEP to try to find out more about triple-walled tanks when they, be, when they may be necessary etc. We're still waiting to hear back from her. Ryan Lynch of South Burke Water District, who is also here tonight, um, had said on the media on our Zoom meeting where we negotiated on the 15th, so that was yesterday, that he had found record of a double-walled uh, tank. I apologize, I did not record the material, which material it was. I don't know if it was steel or fiberglass, but he said that in South Burke Water District's research, they did find an instance of a double-walled tank failing at the 29-year mark. We have asked that they forward any information for that, and this did happen yesterday. They, you know, we all have outstanding items. We're still waiting to hear back from them as to the specifics of that failure, because we certainly would like to address it. Our petroleum engineers have gone on record, as have our tank manufacturers, as stating they stand very firmly behind the 30-year warranty uh, that they put on their double-walled fiberglass tanks. And if there is genuine risk, because again, I've, I've read the Wright Pierce studies, I've read the South Burke Water District studies. This is not a normal site. They do have a well, a well field down gradient. I mean, it's not a normal site, I grant you that. But um, I mean, we definitely want to know if there are, you know, comparable instances of double walled tanks failing because we haven't found any. 
by all accounts, members of the tank of the of the town administration that have been researching the matter couldn't find anything on it either. Um, go ahead. So what's the uh, isn't there a state requirement saying you pull those tanks out anyway and before the twenty? So there was. there was. It's my understanding that it has been removed and now after the thirty year mark when the warranty has expired that they may keep it in the ground if it passes testing and I'm sure Kevin has something to say on this. Sure. So, uh, till a couple years ago, we had a requirement that after 30 years, we have to remove those tanks. But, and a lot of people did it, because they still wasn't sure about the rules and regulation change. But a couple years ago, they changed it, that as long as tank condition is good, and it passes yearly annual inspection, and they don't find anything wrong, you can use those tanks. And it's just, this law just came into Maine, but New Hampshire has this law going on for years, and Believe me, 30 year marks, usually majority of gas stations go under renovation at that, that time period because it's just not tanks, even dispensers and everything is getting old and we usually change it in 30 year period because that cannot be like well used, like we don't feel comfortable using it either, or not even, com uh, not even customer feel comfortable. So usually at that time period, we usually change it. Sir, so yeah, when you say inspection of the tanks, are they are they doing an internal inspection or how are they verifying they, the So every the year we have to go through tank inspection, which usually petroleum company comes on the side and it's just not tanks. They do inspections for everything, including dispensers, lines, tanks, everything. And we have to pass that inspection. And same period of time, just so you guys know, we have to have all the documentation ready, including our tank charts, which shows how much delivery we're getting, how much fuel we're dispensing, our spill log, which we use, usually keep it on site. If less than 10 gallons will happen, when happen, what time, and what you need to clean up. And we have to report that whole spill log to the petroleum company to pass our yearly inspection. But what is the inspection of the tank entailed? Is it, that, that's my question, is it an internal inspection or how are they, the how are they ascertaining that, that tank is, is safe for continued use? So that question probably petroleum companies can answer better. Actually, way, I, was, I was talking to Rick Jordan from Portland Pump, who you're, yeah. you're a client of and we also were a client of Rick Jordan. <coughs> um, and yeah, probably worth having him clarify, but. You mentioned there's a water test and there's a smoke test and also there's a vacuum test. Okay. You have to test, yeah. yeah. I've been involved with feeder roots and all that. You have to test between the inner and outer walls to see if there's an integrity of the walls. Okay. And they do a pressure test or a vacuum and pool. So it depends on the situation. So there's a, there's a so standard It would be that. a pressure test of some sort. Or a vacuum test. Okay. It depends on the situation in the tank. You know, okay. I'm not it's just one or the other. But there's a specific a engineering standard for it. There is a standard for it. Okay. And it's just not a tank. They just check everything. Right. Including covers goes on top of the tank. If it's a little crack, they would not pass your inspection. You have to change that covers before they pass inspection. Something wrong with the nozzle or anything. They will make you clear that issue before they clear the inspection, and that inspection report sent out directly to the DEP. We have no control on it. Even I can't get that report and send it to DEP. It has to go through the petroleum company directly to the DEP. Even we pass or fail, whatever the result, has to be informed to the DEP. And what is the periodicity of that, sir? Is that an annual? Annual, annual inspection, annual. yes. Yep. They're pretty strict about it, even though I do any, like, it's probably totally out of context from this reason, but but I have gas station in Elliot. I had a uh, riser fail, uh, like a riser, the top of the riser wasn't, like the adapter wasn't screwing on it. We had to change that whole riser. <coughs> they cannot deliver until I change riser. Even though I have two tanks, they would not deliver until I change my riser. Even though I'm out on gas, they would not deliver it. And they came to do construction in the risers and all. They write a letter to DEP first and let DEP know that we are working on this tank right now. So it's really strict. It's not like something they just come and do it. They have to report every single movement happened on the gas station and done by the petroleum company. They have to report every single movement to the DEP. And they have, I spoke to the DEP person. They said like, I don't know why, but they said like, we have pretty strict requirement and 
if anybody, I even give contact number to the town administration that they can talk to DEP about any questions they have, because DEP, we have a land where who is handling our whole site at DEP level. And he, I think, I give contact information to Terry that he can, uh, she can contact Dan Weir and ask any questions they have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And before we get too far away from it, I also did want to throw out there, I'm gonna double check this with my notes really quick. Um, uh, let's see. So we also did offer during our, while we're on the topic of tank integrity and especially since, as I believe it was Don who asked about it, there's no longer a requirement to replace your tanks every 30 years. We actually wanted to get ahead of that, and we have offered in our negotiations with South Burke Water District to commit to replacing our tanks every 30 years, rather than risk this, you know, outside of warranty, yearly inspection determines, you know, its fitness to be used. So we have offered to replace it within 30 years. So. And I think what Mr. Patel said makes a lot of sense that, you know, if you think about what a what a fuel, what a gas station pump looked like 30 years ago mm -hmm. compared to today, right? Yeah. You yeah. don't see very many 30-year-old pumps still in, in uh, service today. Yeah. yeah. By, then, by then, there'll be a chip in our forehead that it just reads it automatically and takes our money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, so that's, that's pretty much everything there is to say on the first condition. We're still working on it. Like I said, you know, we have our deliverables. We have to get to South Burke Water District. They have some they got to get to us. Um, moving we, on to condition two. Move on, excuse so, me. Sure. Do we want to let him go through all these and then discuss them one by one, or do you want to discuss them as he brings them up? The other one, this is, that was the mo the longest one for the record. The rest of these are going to be a lot easier to discuss. Okay. I think we should discuss it as they come. Uh, what do you use? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, seeing how we haven't seen any other triple wall tanks in the state, I would find that that would be a not reasonable ask. I mean, there are some gas stations right next to the water. He owns them. Right next to the water. Directly on Sebago Lake. Yeah. It's I, I agree. I mean, it's short of short of some report saying that double wall tanks are no good because of this, or they pose a bigger risk. I think triple wall tank is just an unnecessary expense. I would counter that, in, in my opinion, that it might be a bit premature in making that call. And the only reason I say that is, by your own admission, sir, uh, the state uh, hydrogeologist, that was the term I was looking for in our last meeting, um, as you said, that she's kind of gathering, her, she's on her fact-finding mission to, to make a final recommendation. Did I understand you correct when you said that? She is currently looking into this more and she's speaking with the DEP about it. I don't, you know, that's pretty much all I know about the matter. She, Susan so just said I, she's gonna be looking into it. And, and again- I'm, I'm sorry, sir, go ahead. It's all right, I just, but I just want like, we still have deliverable items on both sides. Mm -hmm. Our official stance, which is pretty well documented, is we think it's a little more than is necessary, mm -hmm. especially given the fact that even in invariance requiring conditions, double wall is considered fine. We don't require a variance with main DEP. And I know I sound like a broken record saying that, but it's the truth. Um, are we a good? Are we good with the first condition? Can I move on? I, I think yeah. I mean, I think my opinion on that is that you know, short of short of some documentation saying that double wall tanks uh, uh, don't meet the requirement, I think that. Well, especially that they're they, they're willing to commit to replace those tanks every thirty years. I mean, that's also a commitment for safety right there. Yeah. Hey, come on up. So, uh, just to inform you guys that I have one of the gas stations right on Sebago Lake, which we were into 26 years, and we changed, you can see the address, you can probably find out on Google also, all the information, 1337 Roosevelt Trail, Raymond, Maine, 04071. We were into 26 years of the gas station, installing uh, tanks and all, we just changed those things in 2016 after 26 years, because we feel like, like the uh, previous owner before I was buying it, we feel like wasn't in a, like we thought like we should need to change it, rather than we change it later on, we should change it right away. We change those, all the pipings, all the pumps, uh, even all the uh, tanks and everything in 26 years. So we are aware about what, what kind of business we are running and we usually change it. And we are also committing them also that we're gonna change it in 30 years. 
going to happen before 30 years, but that's our guarantee that we are we are committing it for 30 years. Thank you. Can I just add, um, the Samaritan Sun's email actually states in reference to the state of Maine's regulations being more stringent than the federal regulations that double-walled tanks with continuous electronic monitoring is today's regulation standard. It is. So they're not even asking for anything more than double-walled in the entire state of Maine. That's correct. Anything else on the matter of triple-walled versus double-walled? I, I just, as you gentlemen were discussing, it sounds like you guys are good with it. I just, by your own admission, you're, you you crafted this, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you disagree, and, and I hear you and I understand, but it says waiting on outstanding tasks from both parties. I think it'd be very premature for us to make a call on that without that additional data. And that's just my opinion on the matter. I don't know how the rest of the board feels on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that too. Uh, if there's outstanding data, I'd like to hear it because it's uh, either either side. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, I, I just I, I want to have all the facts before I, I'd be willing. I mean, I'd like to hear it all. What all is the outstanding data? I guess would be a good question. I will be the first one to say regarding outstanding data that, and I'm sure, and I I do wish to give Ryan a chance to speak on this later. Um, if there is actually a case of a double-walled fiberglass tank failing within the 30 years. And I do want to point out there are, we did find some of this data, in the cases of incorrect installation, the outside of the two tanks can end up being cracked. That's a whole can of worms to get into, but barring those conditions, which as I understand it, still have not resulted in a spill, we weren't able to find anything about a double wall tank failing. But Ryan, I'm sure, has information about it. He said he does, and he will get it to us. But we want to hear this outstanding data as well. We really do want it. And I, I appreciate Phil's want to wait, and I appreciate everyone, you know, those that have spoken up and said, yes, we don't find triple wall appropriate. I appreciate that people are still willing to concede there is still, you know, more homework to be done. I just, I just don't understand why we're why this even a continued discussion if this is the, the platinum standard in the state of Maine and the state of Maine, as you said, was Rick, is a, a higher standard than the federal uh, DEP then, or the EPA, then um, I, don't, I don't know what further information would sway me off of following the platinum standard that we already set in the state of Maine. I think uh, someone from town spoke to Rick Jordan, and right after that, I call him around like 3.30 or 4 o'clock. And I asked him about, because uh, Southbury Water had a question that what is the price difference between double wall and triple wall tank? So I just asked him, I said, like, what is the price difference between those two tanks? He said, like, he's not aware about triple wall tank. He has never even quoted triple wall tank in his entire life. And that's the company who's a Portland firm. That's well known. Like, state of Maine knows just three companies. Portland firm, Seamart and Sons, and uh, GAFTEC. And that's the Portland company was telling, like, they have never even quoted triple wall tank. And he said, like, I'm not even sure. It seems like on the paper they're making it, but he said, like, I'm not even sure they are even making it right now because they have never been installed and never even quoted triple wall tank in their whole history. And uh, we are also talking with Dan Ware at the DEP, and I, I explained him whole this situation. He said, like, he, he has never seen triple wall tank in state of Maine. And he said, like, we have strict, like, same way Rick said, this is like, a, we have strict requirement, more, more stricter than federal requirement in state of Maine. And I'm aware about it, because I have been part of some gas station in down south, some, sta some states. Maine has a lot more strict requirement and a lot more up-to-date data required to clear in our inspection. And state wants more information from us compared to other states. And we have never seen any triple wall tank. Even I heard about it when it came on paper that triple wall tank even exists. Thank you, sir. All right. Anything else? Not matter. 
I guess no, what, what are the action steps on these? Are we gonna just to make a vote on these one at a time? Or well, like by these? their own admission, they're waiting on information from Susan Bro Sorry. from the Water Department. Uh, they're waiting on the applicant. Uh, they're consulting with their team, and Ryan Lynch, the Southborough Water Department, uh, had some compelling evidence that he wanted to present. And I, I just I think if we just green flag that without those outliers uh, we, we're not doing our due diligence again just, so let's just let's talk about those a little bit that's okay. what they're trying i think you know the applicant we're consulting with our team to come up with the value i think that if you read here what they what they said was that they would be amenable to putting triple wall tanks in if uh somebody else is willing to bear the added expense the unnecessary added expense so, you know, them finding out how much, I don't think Southboro Water District is going to pony up the cost for that. And I don't think. They've said they won't, and, you know, it is what it is. So, so I don't think, I think that's a moot item. Well, I. Determining I, the cost of I, it. I did want to just read something that is in the documentation you provided us. It says double wall tanks are the industry standard in fuel storage. Okay, the industry standard. Triple wall tanks provide enhanced containment when site conditions or regulations warrant that. So if you have a really, really, you know, you have a situation where you can contaminate two wells, three wells, actually it would be two in this case probably. More than, more than likely one. One yeah. of them is up Yeah, more than likely one. But I'm just saying I wanted to read that out loud so you could just. I don't think there's any harm in putting a pin in it and going down the rest of the conditions and yeah. then you can then coming if if you find that the standards not met then coming back well this is just a condition that we set to discuss all this information yeah. this isn't it's like not. you said this isn't a condition of approval this is just Correct. we wanted some information yeah. on this stuff and this is this is so this is a this is coming from a request from South Burke Water District which just to reiterate they weren't asked to comment on this. We agreed to negotiate with them on testing standards, which we still are going to get it to. Was testing, sensors, and monitoring. Yes, sir. We and we're going to get to those. Three I promise you. Discussed we have the meetings. Yes, and we have. Yeah, and we're going to get to those immediately after this, almost. Okay. All right. So. Condition two, double walled piping and sumps must be installed to provide the highest level of spill containment outside of the tank. And it should be confirmed that there are no fittings or joints, in parentheses, weak points for potential leaks below grade within the <coughs> XL corrugated duct containment pipe for the fuel pipe. We agree to this. We agree that that should be the case. And furthermore, we are in compliance. There was some discussion about it at our meetings, but um, we've already, it, we had Dan Flagg, who's here today from Wright Pierce, um, had initially said on the 13th when we first met with South Burke Water District that it appeared at the time that we were in compliance. He did some additional homework, still said it looks like it, but we would appreciate a, you know, a statement from your petroleum engineers addressing a specific question, and we got it to them today, same day that he asked the question even. Uh, or, I guess, sorry, next day, but within 24 hours of him asking for a statement from our petroleum engineers, we addressed that, and I believe both parties agree that we are fully compliant with condition two from South Burke Water District. So double wall, double wall pipes, double wall tanks. Yes, sir. Um, so that's condition two. Is that, let me ask you though, is, it, is that a standard procedure, the double wall pipes, or was that an enhanced uh, procedure? It, I believe it's standard. It is, okay. according okay. to your email from Samard and Sons. Yeah. He lists seven regulations for the state of Maine. All of what you said is in those regulations. Yes, sir. So that's condition two. Condition three was the proposed water supply well on the plan should be utilized as a sampling point for routine and specific water quality monitoring with testing every six months for volatile organic compounds or VOCs. With any detection, the testing must become more frequent, the town must be notified within 24 hours of contamination detection, and the town must make the reports available to South Burke Water District within five business days in the event of detection. We actually agreed to this condition across the board. No fighting, no fuss, no anything. Although I do want to point out that 
Town of Berwick administration did indicate that there may be some further consultation necessary on their end of the town must be notified or the town must make I, the report. I can, sure. Go I, ahead, James. Well, I can speak to that. I just, my question was just if you're putting in a town requirement in your conditions of approval, that doesn't make sense. Obviously, if we hear there's contamination, you'll hear from me within minutes. So I just don't know how you put a town requirement. And, and, and if I might, again, this is just a lawyerly procedural thing. To that point, this isn't about the town having additional duties or work. If you are wanting that information, it seems like um, the town shouldn't have to be the middle person. Why not just provide that information directly? <laughs> If I, if Hold on. I may. Hold on, just one second. So in that case, I was totally against it because technically South Berwick is a next door town to me. I have, if I do any testing, I'll be more than happy to provide open books to the South, uh, to the Berwick department. Anybody can walk in and ask me for a report or even I can submit to the Berwick because I'm a Berwick business owner. I have nothing. My business is not connected anywhere to the South Berwick team, and I'm not feeling comfortable sharing every, because this is not one time thing. I have to report South Berwick every six months and I don't feel comfortable reporting next door town to me. Rather than that, I will probably make my books open Anybody, yeah, the, if the, you guys will come the report's only if there's contamination, right? And that's no, they were asking do it every time. It's just I think there in the event of detection. Only if there's detection. Yeah. So you're you're so you're how sending it said, hold on, how it said is all right, so the proposed water supply <coughs> well on the plan should be utilized as a sampling point for <coughs> and specific water quality monitoring with testing every six months for vo volatile organic compounds, VOCs. With any detection, the testing must become more frequent. Town must be notified within 24 hours of VOC contaminant detection, and the town must make the reports available for SBWD within five business days in the event of a detection. And to be clear, we are, we, we agree, we commit to reporting this to you guys immediately. The part that, and we're not, you know, we agreed with everything on our end on this. Um, and yeah, but the thing was, you make it, make it, the condition would be you make it reported to me in, like the town of Berwick and, and South Berwick. We're not the ones asking you to do that, but yes, I, I know. Yeah, and that's... I, I, Kevin's idea of, you know, we make it we make it an open matter, and I, I appreciate it. And just for the record, like I said, you'll be notified. Immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just don't know, like, I'm just not used to putting... Well, okay, I can, James, I can, James, let's just throw yeah. this out, though, like five, six years, we go through different town managers or code enforcement officers and they aren't aware of this. It falls through the cracks. All of a sudden, we get, the town gets it from them and then the town doesn't send it. So if they don't send it within five days, now they're getting in trouble for it. I mean, that yeah. doesn't seem That's right what I'm saying, all. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, could a simple FOIA request or any public information be No, I think, yeah. the, I think I the condition think is you, they, 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 they should just send it directly to the town and the water. Yeah, okay. So, exactly. I guess, I, Mr. Okay. Patel, if, if you're providing the report to our town, and I, I do understand your, your rationale, why should you report to a town that is not not, doesn't have jurisdiction over your project. I would counter with, um, in the in the interest of being neighborly, in the interest of, they have critical infrastructure, very close, that and that within their town, that the business would not be allowed. But it, it is because it, we're we're not going by their town rules. As a good faith gesture, if you're already applying it to us, it's it's one extra step to apply it to them. And I would say only because they have the most skin in the game. It's their public water supply. So why would we be averse to, to yeah, not to I, not doing that? I, right, I hold on, hold on, Irish. Can I interject just real yeah. quick? So just because the guys deal with the like planning end of things and I'm the code officer, so those reports would be coming to me. First of all, documentation that's not involved in any lawsuits is public record. So as soon as I have them, anybody and their brother can come look at them. But as a code enforcement officer, if there's they ever send a report to me that has VOCs, it doesn't matter if it's me or who's in my chair. Your code enforcement officer is required to look out for the health and safety of the public that they serve, which means if there's VOCs, 
I have to notify the town manager, the town manager has to notify South Borough Water. If the town manager is not available, it would be my responsibility, or whoever is in my chair's responsibility, to notify South Borough Water District. So regardless, once it comes to code, it's public record, everybody can have access to it, and whoever is here handling code for the town, if they don't know that they're responsible for that, then they shouldn't even be in a code enforcement position. Okay. So, and I think that's a fair. I, I think that's fair, but I would I would counter with, we had issues with our potable water in our town, and and the the notification for that to go out to our own citizens was arguably delayed. And I understand. So I, if if we I miss the not, if we miss the mark if we miss the mark on right. that, th this is a big much bigger mark. No, I just say there's no issue and there's no question it's public information but that's not the issue well, I, I think, reporting, I think, right like, right correct. yeah if, right, I, if, correct. I could, if i could interject i think this is one of the few times that i'm going to say i uh, wholeheartedly agree with phil um you know <laughs> thank you yeah yeah buy um, a lottery ticket tonight well I, I think that this is a unique situation that you know uh mr patel is not wrong that you know he is in the town of berwick and you know the standards here apply but this is a unique situation that we are uh in close proximity to another public water supply I don't think that you know uh, I don't see what the what the problem would be with if you find VOCs to hitting CC South Borough Water District I mean I don't I don't understand why that's even an issue why you and, know and that report would only come up if there was only the contamination. VOCs. I guess the, the question to me is the redundancy if there are if the town manager is already going to be sending out that email. yeah but, but what if he's not here what if she's not here well, no it's regardless of who's in position at that point it's That's it's in the interest of time the sooner yeah, South no, no, has no. the safer it's going to be let's 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 just talk about just that for a minute because if Irish and James on here and they weren't privy to this meeting right and it's eight years down the road right why would a code enforcement officer automatically notify the town next door no they would notify the town manager and then the town manager would then notify. That's what why? she just said. That's what Only she if the said. town manager well, why? Knew. Where is that because written that that's procedure? Because it's in the vicinity of a wellhead. So a, a major spill like that that's close to a town line, I would assume the town manager would would report it. Well, that's a broad assumption. I mean, that, that is an assumption. Like that's my problem. Yeah. I want to make sure that's, that's an assumption. From my right. code perspective, if you guys want to make it so that they have to report to yes. to both towns, but not making it, I don't see how you can make the, them responsible for I, us having to notify. I really find this right. to be a nonsense issue. You just just notify so both towns. Correct. See, see, we see, will notify both, both of them. Okay. That's fine. I'll notify South Berwick and Berwick both department no problem okay. only reason i was doing it the current board of trustees and superintendent they all know about the situation and we gonna cooperate together like we were doing meetings and all but the problem only comes when whole department change they'll be feeling like more on top of my head like always like what i'm doing that's what we don't want yes it's that's only what that's still. what my thing is like that's what we just don't mm -hmm. want to avoid that other towns keep coming and keep asking questions about what's happening otherwise same thing he said like if i send email out to someone doesn't matter to cc but the current superintendent working with us but if in future something change makes more difficult if other towns get involved into our business rather than our own town that's what the whole scenario but if it's if this is the solution of it will be agreed to send both the report doesn't matter no problem. I think, I think I'm, I'm pretty yeah. firm on that because I think that you know um, like Phil said you know it's, it's I mean it's, it's only <laughs> The only time you have to send this report is if VOCs are found in the water. And I think it's imperative that South Berwick is notified. I mean, I don't, only if there's an issue. Yeah, and there and to your, to your point, report. sir, I, I don't think South Berwick Water District, because you're on our side of the line, uh, yes. it, it's going to be our folks, if, if ever, that need to go down there and do anything. It's not going to be them. It's going to be our town, because you yes. fall within our town limits. So yes, that's what we want to hear. That to be not another town and comes and asks their, questions to us about like what we're doing and we, did you do the test or times due or anything about it. Like You understand what I mean. Yes. If your right. board enforcement walk in my whole store, I don't mind. But if other towns walk yeah, yeah, yeah. and they have it's, it's not like right. comfortable for jurisdiction. It's, a yeah, it's only if there's an yeah. issue. Yes, yeah, definitely we agreed on it. No okay. issue about it. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. 
so the next condition is very very similar so this one was specifically regarding um just the first of the just the first of the two wells um and there's also by the way for anyone who's curious there is some information about that because i know previously and i know this wasn't received very well we had expressed concerns about testing being too expensive south park water district gave us a cost and a company uh according to ryan lynch south Bur of south park water district nelson analytical will handle the testing for 110 dollars per voc so my apologies if we seemed confrontational about cost before we now have a number we've agreed Anyway, condition four, a second monitoring well must be installed into the bedrock between the outlet of the stormwater pond uh, and the wetland in the northeast corner of the lot for routine VOC monitoring to be performed no less than every six months. And again, it's repeating the same language from the last one. With any detection, the testing must become more frequent. The town must be notified within 24 hours of VOC containment detection. The town must take, make the reports available to South Park Water District immediately in the event of detection. And the wells should be uh, designed and constructed under the supervision of a main certified geologist. Just like the prior condition, we've agreed unequivocally across the board to follow that. And as per the precedent that we just set, yes, we will notify South Park Water District for the second well as well. It's just so the we, same. So we will strike out the town and just say the applicant will send information yes sir okay that is that is what we just agreed to yeah they want to say owner if it's sold you want to say owner not okay thank you can uh, can i ask you a question about this because I, I seem to remember us discussing having three uh surface monitoring wells this is this is the part where i'm not really the expert to ask I mean, this is their recommendation, and we really okay. did discuss it a lot and decided it would be best. And the two would be it. adequate? Yeah, they, I mean, they seem to think two monitoring wells would be accurate. And I, for the record, to my understanding, I'm not even sure exactly whether or not a monitoring well is testing just the surface water or if it's also looking at what's underneath. I'm, you know, that's sort of... This is where we need Input from... Okay. Okay. So I mean, but in, in any case, they've, re they've requested the two, we've agreed to the two. All right. And, um, and one more, one more uh, question. You know, when, when one of the things that we discussed and I would like to see in here is, you know, I'm sure that there's engineering standards that go along with testing. Um, if those standards could be included, you know, in other words, you know, we'll, we'll install the wells and we'll do testing as per standard whatever I don't know what the testing standard is but I'm sure there's some engineering standard on how to test those wells or how you know how, like you're saying you're gonna do it every two every twice a year every six months what is that based on I'm writing a note to look into that myself but I feel like that would probably be a better question for South Park Water District. They, they're the ones that asked us to do the VOC testing. Mm -hmm. We agreed. Okay. I don't. So after we go through all of this, should we have South Park Water District speak on this? On I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. Yep. So anyway. Can, sure. So uh, the question about more monitoring well, like less has. So I spoke with myself, spoke with Dan Ware at DEP about monitoring well putting on the side. So the they used to put more monitoring wells, like I think he was talking about four monitoring wells around the tanks. But it was a case in back back in the days where they had a steel jacketed uh, tanks underground because steel jacketed tanks more likely to used to be like there was an issue when it leaks they wanted to find out it leaks through those four monitoring wells around the tanks but the problem was happening is that was the problem putting monitoring well around the tank because when they had a, like overfill if driver had overfill or something that fuel used to go in those monitoring wells around the tanks that's why DEP do not recommend putting monitor well around the tanks and they get away with it since double wall fiberglass tanks started. To clarify, he means directly around directly around the tanks. Not, they not do not, where, not where so want it. So um, I, I just I'd like a little clarification on uh, Mr. Patel, you seem like a, an expert in this. Um, so that you're gonna test the uh, the well that you're drilling for water and you're going to install an additional well for testing. 
But I seem to think that we had a conversation about uh, surface monitoring wells in case of a spill so that you could determine the direction of the flow of water. Am I mistaken on I that? I seem to recall that as well. Yeah, I thought we had that conversation. I could be mistaken. So part of that was we are, there was a lot of discussion about what the testing should be, mm. and we could not agree at the time. That is why we agreed to liaison with South Berwick Water District, and we've agreed to all of their testing conditions. Okay. And so, I again, I encourage you to ask them more about what that may entail. I'm sure they're willing to speak on it. They, I, I imagine they would speak on it today when they. Oh, get we'll to have some questions for them. Good. So. Um, so that was condition four. Um, condition, and so that's conditions two, three, and four were fully in agreement with. And at this point, I just want to point out again, at this point, we have agreed to all of their testing conditions. The rest of the conditions, as well as condition, condition one, don't necessarily address testing. So there is going to be, and I, I encourage you guys to ask us questions about these upcoming unsettled matters and some of the disagreement. Um, point five was that the applicant should maintain an enhanced written spill prevention control and containment plan to prevent surface water contamination. This is an unsettled matter. We aren't disagreeing or agreeing on it yet. The reason being that, and we did ask South Brook Water District, and I'm sure they would be happy to speak on this themselves, that they aren't specifically looking for an SPCC plan, which under the EPA, the modern EPA definition is a spill containment control and countermeasure plan. They're very, very involved. They're specifically tailored to above ground tanks or below ground tanks. I wanna say the number was of greater than the quantity of 42,000 gallons of storage. And what they clarified is, and I explained this a little bit in this document, um, they're not necessarily looking for just like a direct SPCC plan as outlined by the EPA. They're more so looking for the provisions to deal with surface bills <laughs> and how we handle them be addressed. Um, this is an unsettled matter because we are still doing homework on our end to get more information to South Berwick Water District and the board about exactly how we handle the matters of, of <coughs> surface spillages, how we train our employees to handle surface spills, and just the general procedure as a whole. Um, and that is the only outstanding item. There is not an outstanding item from South Berwick Water District's end. This is just homework on our end that we are working on. To try to get them more information about what we do, um, especially <coughs> addressing surface water spills. But, and I also, I submitted a document to Terry as well regarding the EPA defined SPCC and everything that comes with it. We're not gonna go for a full SPCC plan, but we are going to try to work with the water district to get a more suitable for agreement that, you know, actually deals with our unique situation as opposed to something more general that might be more vaguely minded. So I, I, could, I could be off a little bit, but it doesn't seem like that <coughs> report would come from the water district as much as the petroleum company. Like how would you, you know, what would be this? Because I think what, if, if I understand it correctly, yeah. what that's looking for is what's the standard operating procedure for a spill. Yeah, and I don't again, think the water district is going to be the expert in that. I mean, I'm sure they have their opinion on what they would like no, to see so it doesn't contaminate groundwater. Right. I think what we're all asking, Mr. Patel, you know, to have something there for your employees or whatever, if whether it's somebody at the pump spills gas <coughs> or if the truck spills gas or something else happens, there's a plan in yeah, place. I have trouble believing that, that that already isn't part of this whole it package. Should, it so should be based on the requirements. So it is a requirement. I explain the whole scenario to them that AB operator, one AB operator is always staying on the side, no matter what condition is. So we usually keep two AB operators, just one is me and one is our manager. And they're well trained to do like small mechanic jobs or even spill. In the case of spill, we have like absorbent pads, speedy dry, all those products available, how to deal with it and how to, re if it's more, more, spill on the ground, how to report DEP, all those procedure is standard procedure AB operator has to follow. And they had questions about this more de detail because we had a 24 hours 
gas station, gas pumping system. Mm -hmm. So they had a question that, what about those seven hours when you close the store? But we already answered that question now, that we are not allowing people to pump gas while those seven, uh, on the seven hours when no, no attendant on the side. So we are just allowing people to pump gas during our business hours only. So, so that, that, that will resolve the issue. Guy there. Uh, at all times. Yes, so wh whenever the spill happen or any, any situation comes like that, one person will be there who gonna report it and uh, they know how to handle this whole situation. And we, we sure have to have AB operator. DEP regulation, right? That is the EP regulation. AB operator is the DEP regulation. We and have to have manual, it. manual, right, that he can pull up and say we have a spill. Here's so what we yes, do. we have, uh, I explained further that we have a spill log. Right. A spill log explains like when it happened, how much you expecting, like how many gallons on the ground, what you did to clean up that. If it's more in a volume, we usually let DEP know also, and we usually let fire department, local fire department know that this happened, and they usually clean up, and they, they help, they come and help and clean up the whole scenario. This is the document I gave. Yes, and I think we replied to that replied, whole thing. Right yeah. in here, it spells out what they have to have. Yeah. And what they so have they, to so they, are, they have that then? They should have that. Now, my only question question would be is there something we're missing that South Berwick's bringing in that so good question for the yeah you can ask them that, that question right. if anything we missing and the AB operator training has to take it every three years we have to take a test every three years and that certificate has to be ready while they come for the annual inspection also without that certification person on the side they will not clear your your, your annual inspection yeah. either I think so that's the part reason of that, I, that I asked that about the DEP and about that is because you know, I think that this is a very cumbersome uh, approval process for us and uh, you know I think that we're trying to reduce the redundancy so in my opinion if the DEP says you have to have this manual yes then I, I you know then so exactly situation happened when we had a meeting that I told them we have we have to have a spill spill log on the site available and we have to report everything but they were asking me that what about every morning when you walk in the store you're gonna walk around and make sure and even though nothing no spill happen you have to report like no spill happen and all those things that's not a normal standard we have to walk around the building make sure everything's everything as per the requirement is good if no spill happen on the ground there is nothing to report like you can't go over well, there I every can day see that too if you if you were you know allowing people to pump their own gas after hours that may be more, you yes. know, more right. important. Yeah, yeah. so that's why we, we reduce that problem and we try to avoid that thing because we not ex we were doing the 24 hours. It costing me a lot more do 24 hour service because we have to do like those kind of fire suppression system and everything. But we were just doing it because that whole route has nothing you can get a gas at night. People really struggle because Cumberland Farm does not allow that. And if we don't allow it, people will really struggle. And that's what the reason I, I wasn't expecting to get that much of a revenue, which will even cover the cost of doing 24 hours. It will not pay for the cost of doing 24 hours in that seven hour window. You're not generating that much of revenue, but that helps people travel to the road. That so it's more convenient. More convenient factor, yeah. And especially people go to CPR early morning. No gas stations open early morning. They can't get gas or anything. And that's what the whole whole scenario is like to help them out. But if that's not the case, then we'll close that seven hour window, no issue. So guys like me that try to figure out how many miles past zero I am, <laughs> are in trouble. Just, just to bring up, just up the road, four miles in North Berwick, there is a 24 hour gas that, station right there. So that that's miles? what the questions I, I told them. I said like DEP has a straight requirement yep. that what we, we should do, like we provide that whole booklet to you for 24 hours. That gas station in North Berwick on the four way is 365 days, 24 hours, no attendant on the site. Right. At all. At all. Nothing. But right. we explained the scenario, but they had a question that it's not close to our aquifer, so they, had, they said, like, we don't care about it. But uh, that's things to consider, that they had 24 hours, no attendant available at all. 
and a lot of gas station works that way that they are allowing 24 hours, 7 or 8 hours without attendant on the site. And that's close to a stream. Yeah, but if, if that can satisfy South Bay River water, mm -hmm. I'll be more than happy to shut down what the seven, mm -hmm. 7 hours, no problem. So I think I think short of, you know, we'll, we'll, that's a question for South Power Credit. If they have yep. something beyond that, then... Mm -hmm. okay. You guys want to think the old requirements are in there? You just put it back through it, throw it in there. All right. So number six um, was D required DEP compliance reports, spill event reports, test failures, and, are, and a written and exercise emergency response plan should be sent to the town code enforcement officer by the applicant. The, sh the town should make those reports available to the South Burke Water District within five business days or sooner. Um, so we generally disagreed. We found this to be a little cumbersome. All these DEP uh, required compliance reports are already public information, and we have an outstanding piece of homework to do to confirm that, by the way. Um, we plan on, once I, I, I plan on speaking with Dan Ware from Maine DEP, and we want to find out a little bit more about the timeliness of when the reports are available, because we've been to I've been told that they're ready immediately. We've already talked quite a bit about, you know, how the bet what the best method is to make all of our reports, you know, go to the right people in as timely a manner as possible. Um, I mean, the, and furthermore, the DEP compliance reports and all of these things, they're not necessarily done uh, by us. I believe they're done by our petroleum engineers. Um, so, I mean, we still need to find out more about exactly how timely they're they're made publicly available for Maine DEP, but it's our opinion that if they're already, go ahead. It spells it out in there. You know, yeah. You have to report to, they give the 1-800 number and everything and everything, yeah. 24 hours mm -hmm. and all that. It's spelled right out yeah. in there. I know, but the, the question was more so how quickly does DEP make it publicly available to everyone else? That's, That's what we still have to do our homework okay. on. Yeah. I, th I think that that goes back to the thing about, you know, us not being petroleum engineers and right. relying on, you know, is he, is he DEP compliant? Well, he's waiting from this guy, so it's waiting to hear back from the experts so yeah so we just still have on the time frame of when they have to do the report right right but again that's a DEP requirement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in the sometime what happened is like even though like suppose for one of my gas station we had uh, annual inspection done back in November January DEP is calling me that they haven't received the inspection report because hmm. petroleum company already did it. They cleared the inspection. They give me paper that you cleared it, but then they forget to send it over to DEP. So sometimes some things is not, uh, not un, are under our control. We can see that we clear it, and after that, it usually send out directly from petroleum company to DEP. We never play any role in that situation because of that it's little kind of like a confidential matter that what reason I fail and everything, they usually let me know and I have to fix it, but they're not gonna give me a report of that. That will be reported directly to DEP. That's how the procedure works. So if town asking, like South Berwick town ask us to send the report out to them, it use, that's why we say that it is available to the DEP publicly. You can ask DEP any time about that report, but not like annually I can, keep sending it out to them and I cannot ask petroleum company specifically that this is this condition we agreed on so you have to send it to South Berwick. It's just little, not like a mechanism doesn't work that way a little bit. So it is available to- I, to I think for me, you know, as long as you're following the DEP requirements on that, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Yeah. The other one that, that I wanted to, really wanted the concession on was that if you found VOCs in the well water, yes. that you would notify yeah, someone. Yeah, we had agreed on it. Agree to yeah, that, no so. I do have one simple question. You, you mentioned um, your spill report, your spill log that you do. Yes. Um, this particular number six mentions spill event reports. Where does that log go? Or or is that for your own personal? So, yes, we keep that log available on site every time, available for any DEP members who walk in the store or any petroleum You don't have to send it to anybody? Uh, we have to show that spill log to annual inspection timing okay. to the petroleum company when they come up. They ask you for spill log, they ask you for your tank chart also, like how much, even though we have digital system available with the route, that what delivery we're getting, how much we're selling, we still have to make tank chart to make okay. sure 
like we're not getting more fuel than we required right. so that way like overfill happen and all those scenarios we have to keep tank chart also like a spill log okay. on site available thank and you anybody can walk <coughs> in and ask for it and it'll be available over there thank you all right anything else on condition six Cool. All right. Condition seven was if the applicant becomes regulated as a public water supply and requires any waiver, regardless of installation of on-site treatment, such as carbon tanks, the applicant must complete the waiver specified hydrogeologic assessment for review by a Department of Water Protection staff geologist. We find this condition to not be applicable. We've already submitted a letter, or rather, Brian Barrington, Kevin's attorney, already submitted a letter stating that we don't, we, we are not a public water supply. All of Kevin's existing gas station projects are not found to be public water supply, and we will go on record as saying that if somehow this one is somehow different from the others and we're found to be a public water supply, we will adjust our operation to, to remedy that, as we don't wish to be held to the standards that come with. So we found that condition to be not applicable, and I don't think there's anything else to really say. Did the stools plan to that at all? I remember that being a... No, I saw that that was actually explained away in an email uh, we were talking about the stools and whether it makes it a restaurant or not and there was a, a stipulation that said you had to be able to provide public drinking water to 60 people a day or something right. you don't meet that so i think 25. it's a moot point mm -hmm. stools are out yeah 25 people 25 people yeah Okay. So that goes over all the conditions we've been negotiating with South Burke Water District. Um, and I just want to reiterate what we agreed to was negotiating testing standards, and we have fully agreed to all of that, including making the concession just now that we will send them all of the reports directly. So that's where that stands. And not, those were not all the reports. Go ahead. Um, not all the reports. Yeah, all sorry. the reports of uh, yes, signing sorry. VOCs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Looking out for us. I appreciate it. Um, so that those were our three big outstanding items. Um, you know, you got your two letters from Brian. One talking about our applicability as a public, as whether or not we are are not a uh, public water supply. Um, and the other one that was just stating that you know we're not really seeking any particular action against any particular board members. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's where it's at currently. Our stormwater plans, our site plans, and all of that have yet to be updated since the prior set of plans that was submitted. I believe that was two meetings ago now, maybe three. I can't re quite remember recall, but um, we do anticipate as uh, as negotiations draw to a close with Southburg Water District that we will be updating our site plans to indicate the location of these monitoring wells. Um, we will be updating our operation and maintenance plan for stormwater to make sure that any you know any relevant pieces are you know properly addressed there. So there may be some small updates coming with plans and our procedures, but other than that, I believe we've met all the outstanding requirements and requests. All right, any questions? You tired? You a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> I guess I, for one, would would just want to say that um, I think you guys have done a, a tremendous amount of work to try to meet all of the requests put in front of you by either us or South Berwick or anyone, um, which I think is commendable. Um, I also see that basically what we've talked about today, you have a few more T's to cross and a few more I's to dot, update your plans and then come back to us with kind of a final push package of, of everything. A couple more pieces of data that you're waiting on for some people, some homework of your own. Um, so I think for me, um, I am satisfied with no more questions about what I want from you just to wait and see the results of all of what you still have to do and I think more specifically I, I agree with your comments sir um, with item one you, by your own admission there were some deliverables there yes, sir. with item uh, number five uh, your outstanding item working with procuring documentation addressing the standard 
Um, I think, I, I feel like you may have put that one to bed. I, I feel um, like I did. Yeah, I feel like you put that one to bed. Uh, so the only other outlier would be uh, item number six, where you're awaiting uh, that information from Maine DEP. I just. I thought on number four we were talking about the number of test wells. We wanted to figure out the number of test wells. And I believe that was number five. Let's have yeah. uh, the <coughs> South Borough Fire District. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, we wanted we just yeah, to hear from South Borough. Call all the yeah. MPs. Yeah. All right. <coughs> so, so the reason behind that is to make sure what you're presenting to us and what we're hearing, everybody in, a, in agreement that there's no holes that we missed. Anyway. Yeah. And for the record, I know this email went out literally 11th hour. I think it was like 4.30 or something that it actually went out yeah. I do want to point out that when you bring South Berwick Water District up if they disagree with anything that's said there I very much encourage them to you know express that I've certainly tried my very hardest to keep diligent notes on everything for this project and be as transparent as possible so by all means ask them whatever you got we have to and if they have some disagreements on how things went where negotiations stand we would very much like to hear it and try to address it okay all right Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So now, South Berwick Water District, would you like to come up and discuss this? Hi, Ryan Lynch with South Berwick Water District. And Dan. Uh, Flag, who is our engineer, you might want to come up and, and talk if I don't give you enough information. So, do you have specific things you want me to address, or can I? I have a question. Yes. Um, I noticed you guys, you know, waving, trying to get our attention. <coughs> thing about a tank that failed. Yes, I have that information. On a tank that failed in Provo, Utah, it was the same double walled own uh, double walled um, fiberglass type tank that we're putting in here. It failed at like the twenty eighth year. Um, so, and also there's I'll, I wanted to hand out the article to everybody. Not only did the tank fail, but all the monitoring failed, and the pe and the person that is supposed to monitor it failed. So, I mean, there's really three pieces to all of this. It's the protection, the monitoring, and you got to have good people that, that do this. And in addition, we were talking about, you know, really uh, thankful that they're pulling the eight hours um, because even in Maine, I have some information on two big spills in Maine that were doing during storms when uh, places were still open. Um, and the, I mean, you would think that with cameras there, people wouldn't hit things and just run, but that's basically what happened. Two plowers came in that were contracted to these stores and they hit the, the dispensary and in one of them, they lost 1800 gallons before a second person drove in and actually, um, you know, actually called it in. The person, the, the two flowers did not call it in, they just went away. So I'm grateful that they changed that. Um, so that so really can doesn't I, apply. Can we get back to the yes. tank failure? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that a tank failed after 28 years. Uh, yeah, 27-ish. So 27 27-ish 27 years. So that was after scouring the internet to find one that failed. Do you know how many tanks were in service in that 27-year period? Uh, I, first of all, I didn't scour the internet for this. I, it just fell into my lap. Okay. Um, do I know how many? Now, this was probably, I think, it was installed in 1989. So, and, you know, what I, where I'm going with this yeah. is that, you know, I understand that if a tank failed is catastrophic, right? And nobody wants that. But if there's, you know, 35 million tanks in the ground and one of them failed in 27 years, I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good track record. Well, so I, I mean, we could have somebody come, but I don't think it's one out of all of them. There are other tanks that are failed, is my understanding. It's just that we don't know about all of them. Who's going to spend the, the time to research those? I, and, and I only go back to that because I, th yeah. I, you know, I think that looking at the, the, the standards about you know, a double-walled or a triple-walled tank and the fact that you know, virtually nobody uses triple-walled tanks, if this were a, a common problem, double-walled tanks failing, then I think that places would be requiring triple-walled tanks. I do think the double wall tanks are a lot better than 30 years ago, but why would why do you think they have triple wall tanks? 
because it, you know, it's they wouldn't have them if they didn't need them or didn't expect to use them. And I think it's like anything else. You know, maybe in 10 years, you're going to see hundreds of them, depending on, you know, what happens. Mm -hmm. More towards what you were saying, Les, is what uh, Wyatt had said about that is the main DEP doesn't even recommend them in the sensitive areas, let alone the not sensitive areas. So I'd be leaning towards that as well. I think that was that was my only question on that. I mean, I think in terms of, you know, if you look at the drinking water program, they are calling it a sensitive area. I mean, it really is. Just because you have one, per one place that says it isn't and another says it is, it's hard to know what to, you know, what to, to do. I well, understand I think the that. The EPA is a ruling body on this, right? But that doesn't mean that they can understand everything that's going on. The drinking water program is a ruling body for us, and they are the people that are looking at water supply. The DEP is looking at groundwater, not necessarily thinking about, um, you know, drinking water supplies. What percentage of the drinking water in South Berwick? is accessible underneath that general area? Hmm. Um, anybody know that? Um, I think... I don't understand the question, I guess. Like, yeah, what uh, percentage do we well draw country. from that area? Yeah, yeah, uh, of all the Maybe all the 25%? water. Maybe 25 percent? How much? Uh, maybe 25 percent. Okay. Yeah. And then we also talking about expanding that well field because there actually appears to be some decent water there. And the other thing I wanted to point out is one gallon of gasoline can contaminate 750,000 gallons yeah. of drinking water. Well, yeah, on that particular subject. So let's assume there is a contamination mm -hmm. and a certain number of gallons get into the water supply, into the aquifer. Um, how do you get the genie back in the bottle there? How, how does that happen? What do you do? Uh, money, really, and pro and monitoring, like with with this Provo, Utah tank, it was leaking three months before it actually had a catastrophic failure into the system, and all the electronic systems that were supposed to find it, on, uh, supposed to look at it on a monthly basis, all the people that do an accountability thing on a daily basis, they never saw it because it was just a small leak. And so none of those actually saw it. And, and they went back after they had the catastrophic catastrophic failure and looked at it was a small leak back then and it, those are the really hard ones to find and it's only four months later they would have kept going with a leak it was only because there was a catastrophic failure that they actually knew something was going on and then they look back at the results and say okay yeah it does look like something was going back something happened back in November when you're talking about February when there was, was the release because there's a downward trend, but the technology is looking to see if, if, if there's a big drop. And if it's just leaking slowly, they can't, that technology cannot tell. And there should have been a backup from the second person, the person that does a daily look at the differences on what went out and what came in, and that failed. So mm -hmm. there's those three types of things that can fail that you have to have a lot of um, backup plans and what we're talking about with the uh, emergency response plan and with the SPCC plan what that is is on a daily basis you look at things are you stocked you know does anything look strange um, is something happening you know um, a lot of times you go to a you know is the absorbent restocked even something simple like that do you, you update your contacts? That should be done regularly because these contacts change. We actually had a plan. But I, I think what I'm getting mm -hmm. at is if there is contamination into 25% of mm -hmm. South Berwick's water supply, how do you cure it? What's the what's the cure? Um, what they you and, and and by the way, it's you, not just South Berwick. It's yeah. all the abutters in that area from Berwick who are on wells that go into that aquifer. Yeah, I mean that would be a, a 
you know, that would be taken out of our hands. Um, Why? Involve money. I mean, we would probably do the monitoring. Yeah. And we would involve the drinking water program and the DEP, and they would start cleanup and decide on where to start cleanup. And then the drinking water program would be involved with us on, you know, what's happening with the well sites and we do we need more monitoring here? Um, and then they would decide on, you know, what can do we need to put in treatment or do we need to go to an entirely different well? You know, because sometimes treatment isn't going to be cost effective in terms of getting water to people. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. You said one gallon of fuel contaminates how much water? 750,000 gallons of drinking water. So in looking at in this failure in Utah, 55,000 gallons was released from the double wall fiberglass tank into the subsurface soils and groundwater. And that would basically equate to 41 billion gallons, which would be, I calculated out, it's like 400, 450 years of our supply in South Berwick. So I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's important to get this done in terms of safety. You know, that's, that's the reason why we always, we're doing this, we're talking to our partners. We want to, how, how, do, how can we be safe? I mean, we really um, don't want the installation, we don't feel it's appropriate, but we went and tried to negotiate what we thought might get us somewhere where we have a, we can sleep at night. It's all about safety. Mitigating yeah. risk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how do you feel that the negotiation has went with Mr. Patel? I mean, because we see some give and take on this. It seems like he has conceded to some of the monitoring and, and specifically, I think we had a question about number five where it said the applicant should maintain and enhance written spill prevention, control and contaminant plan to prevent subsurface water contamination. <coughs> but I think that what we landed on was that that's, a, that's probably a DEP requirement already. Uh, well, I mean, just out of curiosity, y you see when people talk about this, they have AB cer certification. I was like, what does that entail? Last night, I went and got my B certification, which took me an hour. I went online, took a 25 question test, and now I have certification as a UST operator, class B, from the EPA. It's, it's not you need to have things in place to double check everything you're doing. You can't just have somebody walking around without saying, okay, you know, I didn't check this, I didn't check that, because it's critical that you see the little things that are happening so you can see if it continues to get worse. Or, you know, make sure that, that everything is stocked so you have it when it's available, not just do it once a year. And, People get complacent when they're, you know, they d end up not doing it. So checklists, and and that's basically what we we're talking about, putting together checklists and checks rather than just thinking that you're going to catch everything when you walk around the the building, is the best way to do that. And it provides um, people can double check on what you're doing, and you provide a history where you can see if something's getting worse. It's not just, oh, do, did that look that way yesterday or last year? How, how would somebody know? And I don't think there's going to be somebody always there, an A or B is gonna, always going to be there at the site. Um, people need to be fully trained to understand what's going on. The, at this, also in Utah, they say that one of their employees went on vacation when this happened, so they don't have that data when that person went on vacation. And that would have helped to try and ascertain and know that there was a problem with this tank. So there's, there's a, a number of different things that are always, you know, playing with each other to make sure some, everything gets taken care of. So do you, do you know how much that spill, how much water that spill contaminated? Uh, it, it wasn't above a drinking water supply. It just said, so they remediated it all around. And I'll, I'd be happy to uh, give you guys some uh, this tonight. Tonight. Okay. So mm -hmm. the the other question that that we were kicking around was uh, the proper number of test wells uh, for surface contamination. Mm -hmm. So. 
Uh, could you clarify that for us? How you feel about that? And what? Because we had, we had we yeah. had heard that there were three wells typically mm -hmm. that were needed. Dan, uh, our engineer, to do hear that. that. So, so I'd love to hear that. Okay. Um, Dan Flag, Wright Pierce. Um, so to uh, can you uh, repeat the question again, just so I have it straight? Yeah, the uh, we're talking about uh, the test well using the uh, the drilled well. Yep. Plus another well, and that being acceptable for testing of VOCs. VOCs. Yeah. So the property, I believe, is just over two acres. <coughs> so it's a fairly small lot, mm -hmm. um, and where they showed the the drilled well for the public water supply on their site plan um, in the lower right hand corner there is on the down gradient side towards where the groundwater is flowing towards junction well. So we thought that would be a logical spot to um, where they're already doing the well that's going to go into the bedrock. The bedrock aquifer is really our, you know what's critical here because that's where the, the fractured network is supplying the junction road well um, and also the same aquifer also supplies uh, Blackmore which is in Berwick as well. As far as the second well, because it is a relatively small site and we don't have the liberty of having a hydrogeologic assessment, um, we wanted to propose something that we felt was practical and not over complicating things and being more costly for, for the owner of the property. So the second prioritized spot that we identified was um, to the upper right hand, which is on the end where the stormwater um, ponds discharge, and that water flows to that wetland in the back um, right here. Yeah. So we felt like if we could get a, that would be the other prioritized spot if there was a, um, a long-term or a chronic um, infiltration of uh, uh, surface runoff in the parking lot over time through the stormwater basin. Um, if we had a drilled monitoring well on that side of the property, it would more, be more likely to pick up uh, contaminants in that direction from the surface water discharge. Whereas the, um, the, the well on the lower right, which is immediately down gradient of where the tanks would be located. So we felt that was a reasonable um, approach there to drilled wells to capture that. Uh, but again, because it's a fractured bedrock aquifer, it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a, um, you know, randomness when you're drilling a well. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of taking a chance. I mean, we could, <laughs> we could request four or five and increase the odds that we would have a, a more robust network. But I felt like, you know, there is a, you know, a reasonableness in the request that I think we had to balance here. And I felt like this. Would you, would you almost be better served, and, and I'm just probably showing how naive I am to the process, but like, yes, the one drilled well, which is going to service their property, but by doing a second drilled well and fracturing into the bedrock, are you, are you not making it easier to introduce? No. No? Okay. I no, just, it, you, you're just drilling. It's, 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 no, it's no different than a residential well. So you're, you're drilling into the, into, the, into the bedrock and just intercepting a fracture that's <clears> already there. But what I'm, I guess what I, the point I'm trying to get to is, it, so he's going to drill a well for drinking, and rather than drill a, a second well, like, like you're talking about a deep water well for monitoring, would not a surface monitoring be a little more adequate and less risky for contaminating the groundwater by having two accesses through the bedrock to the aquifer? Just. I don't, I don't think that would be a, a concern as far as having the two bedrock wells. Um, the surface monitoring, um, again, we didn't propose it. Um, it, you know, it's, it would be a nice to have, but again, we were trying to come up with, you know, the, the most practical, reasonable request here. Um, given the circumstances. So the second well made more sense than yeah. the three monitoring wells? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That answers your question. Yeah, yeah. And the other, the other part of the property, I think the septic system is proposed over this corner here. Great. So, I get, so that we're all clear, I think we're just looking for, is there a requirement which states someplace what should be done for yeah, so this size. so for groundwater sampling, I think I think you had a question about the or someone had a question about the the standard for engineering standard for sampling. Right. So D I'm that geek. Yeah. yeah. So DP does have a, um, a, a groundwater sampling a well sampling procedure. 
uh, for, for sampling uh, monitoring wells. So yeah, I mean, I, I just mentioned it because I'd like to see that as part of the as part of the plan that you know we're going to yep. follow this standard, this procedure. Yep. Right. And there is that makes um, sense to me. Yeah. So there's an actual procedure for the for the sampling process that DEP has in their requirements. It doesn't fall under the underground storage tank, but general monitoring well standards. And then as far as the, the VOC sampling, there's a there's an EPA test method for that that would be referenced. Right. Okay. I guess to go one step further, does it does that procedure delineate how many wells or a parcel of this size you should have? That <laughs> we would have to get into a hydrogeologic study and that very costly and again, you know, it's it's, it's, and I, I think that's kind of why we were kind of alluding to the triple wall tank because we were trying to come up with a plan to minimize the risk, like Ryan said, so so we can sleep at night um, without overcomplicating and getting into hundreds of thousands of dollars of studying the geology of this small parcel. So we we kind of used that approach as kind of what we felt was a, a belts and suspenders. Okay, well they have this tank as an option in the submittals that were submitted to the planning board. It didn't seem like a huge leap uh, to go to a triple wall tank. That said, there are some outstanding questions that came up tonight that we, I think the board um, has given us the opportunity to investigate a little bit further. Um, I would say that uh, the Junction Road well that we're talking about being at risk here has been in service for 30 years, since 1994, and the reports that we've all cited were based on the development of that well. Junction Road well, we heard tonight, supplies about 25% of the water for South Berwick's water district. That, that well should be in service for well beyond our lifetimes. Okay, that's, that's an important resource for the community of uh, South Berwick. Um, so I, I just don't want it to go unnoticed that, you know, the, the water district is charged with protecting the public health in terms of the drinking water supply. So the, you know, this is not something that's taken lightly. Um, I think as professionals, I'm a professional engineer. Um, I want to protect the public health with drinking water. Uh, I, I also understand the double wall tank is the DEP standard. However, it seemed reasonable that um, for sensitive areas with a drinking water, public drinking water supply, that the triple, water, triple wall tank could be a good option here to mitigate some risk. Um, so we'll hopefully get some more answers to that um, before we meet with you again. Quick question, how much water volume does that junction, hell wet, wet, that junction head well go through in a day? Uh, what's the flow rate of that, John? Uh, it's, it's rated at 150 gallons a minute. It generally produces around 50,000 gallons a day. 50,000, okay. Yeah. So I, I have a question. You know, several meetings ago, we had a discussion based on a report by either you or your company um, in reference to the distance that a, a gas station should be from that wellhead. Yeah. And there was question because there were two numbers in there, 3,000 feet and 4,000 feet. And I just wanted to confirm that I, I think I understand that the 3,000 feet is for a gas station and the 4,000 feet is for a tank storage facility. And yeah. those are clearly two different things, but people, I don't think people were picking up on that nuance so they were yeah. saying, oh, it's 4,000 feet, and this is 3,750. Yeah, I, tr I tried. I don't know if you had a chance to read my response. Um, it, it was, I think it was an added to the planning board packet, but I tried to clarify that discussion from the last meeting. But the important part here is that um, um, the wellhead protection area includes three zones, uh, one being the most, um, the, the smallest zone around the immediate vicinity of the well. The zone two, which is that intermediate zone, that included, I think it was a 1,500 to uh, 3,000 feet, which is what you're referencing. What we're talking here with this project is, is the zone three, which is the um, uh, within, within the watershed of Lover's Brook and within 4,000 feet of uh, outside the zone two, but still within the zone three of route four. 
So the 4,000 feet is the part of the zone three wellhead protection plan. Right. And, and specifically it said the fueling stations shouldn't be within that 3,000 no, foot um, perimeter. Basically what that said, and I also tried to address that in my, in my letter from the last meeting, is that the 1994 report cited, um, it wasn't an exhaustive list, but it identified uh, types of uses that could lead to leaking chemical contaminants into the ground. There were things cited like landfills, um, above ground storage tanks, bulk storage, and there were some inconsistencies in nomenclature in different parts of the report. But the long story short is, um, you know, anything with bulk fuel storage, um, you know, would be classified with the types of uses that were concerned back in 1994 for this area. So that was the point there. Not, in, not specific definitions on, you know, volume of above ground storage or underground storage or gas, gas stations and so forth, but it was a general, kind of like tonight when you're talking about the light industrial category, there was a category in the 1994 report that identified, you know, potential chemical uh, uses that use chemicals or fuels that could be released into the ground. That was really the category that that report addressed. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I don't think, I don't think if, I mean, if a tank let go and 55,000 gallons of gasoline is flowing downhill towards the well, feet isn't going to matter. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just not going to matter. Yeah, I think the, 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 the bigger, it's, it's, it's not so much a catastrophic, a catastrophic failure that's going to be a short duration even a surface spill. It's going to be more the chronic, it's leaking for a long period of time, getting into the aquifer and, and you know, that's where the, the unknown is what you can't see. And I know you have the electronics and, and obviously the double wall tank is a big step up in technology from the, from the single wall steel tanks, no doubt about it. As I'm sure the monitoring is much better the electronic monitoring is much better than it was 27 years ago. I have to assume so, yeah. I mean, all technology. Uh, but as you know, there's always, there's always the human error. There's always failures. And, you, you know, what's at risk? You know, there's, you know, you could do the exhaustive research. But again, I think the general consensus is in the conditions we've kind of talked about with, with the applicant, I think it was, it was approach from South Berwick's part to come up with a, you know, what's a reasonable approach here based on what's been submitted, including the applicant's materials, what are the options available uh, to minimize risk, and what are the general requirements as far as reporting in um, water safety. So that was the general approach. Chair? Yeah, question. Not to go back to be a dead horse, but the number of wells, that survey's already done. Isn't it? That was done in '94 for that whole area. That you could use that well, for determining. There were some. So as part of that, there were there were, there were not specific uh, wells put on that property. There were some down gradient wells that were monitored as part of the Junction Road to come up with the maps to understand okay. the groundwater flow from that direction. Yep. Um, to the extent that we we do understand the area uh, from a groundwater flow perspective, that's pretty well documented. But as far as um, what the fracture network looks like below the ground of that property, that's a bit of a, we have no idea. We'd just be guessing at this point. Yeah, you could, you could drill a well and go 700 feet and not hit water and move over five feet and go 200 feet. Exactly. Bedrock is hit or miss. I do know that um, on the junction road, I did look at the log for that. Obviously, that's almost 4,000 feet away. but. The, the top of the bedrock was highly fractured, um, so that is a characteristic of some bedrock geologies, depending upon how hard the rock is, the type of, so could be very, you know, we don't know. Um, the public when, well. they, when they drill the well for the property um, on this project, the two wells, um, obviously that will provide some information about the site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question, but it may be more directed to South Berwick Water. Um, there's another gas station in South Berwick, Cumberland Farms, on 236, and I know that tanks get replaced. I don't know exactly when the last time those tanks were replaced. I know, I remember seeing it done. I've lived around here my whole life. Did they put a triple-walled tank 
in the we Cumberland? Near our water supply. Yeah. yeah they, they were done three years ago to answer your question. Three years. But they're nowhere, nowhere near our water supply. Immiscible water is surrounding the whole area. Okay. Okay. I guess the question would be. So you don't yeah, consider okay. that a sense a, yeah, a, a, a sensitive area? Concern for that. And for you. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. For yeah. And yeah. to and be honest, I'm not sure how. Station right there. there were some references of, of how DEP interprets a sensitive area. I, and they all have I don't double. really right. know right. that definition or how that was determined. Again, I'm speaking in terms of the risk to the water supply, the community water supply. So from that perspective, um, you know, my opinion, if my, as a professional engineer, it is a sensitive area of concern okay. for sure. And to, to the extent that mitigation steps with the available technology <coughs> implemented to reduce that risk, however small it could be, um, in my judgment, would be a proper thing to strongly consider. So can I just ask you, your general, did you read this document? That come out at four thirty. I haven't. No. Okay. I was driving here. here. <laughs> yeah. So actually, I, I was being driven here, so I was able to read it. Um, <laughs> did you hear the questions that we went through? I'm sure you were sitting back there, right? So yep. my my general question is, you know, what is your overall feeling of the resolutions here and and the kind of give and take? Do you feel like it's landing us in, you know, potentially best possible scenario of of protecting that water? I do if the triple wall tank is on the table. I, to me, that's the most important part. And again, I haven't done the research and I can't argue whether or not there's a, a triple wall tank in the state of Maine. There, there may not be. But from the perspective that this gas station is upgrading of a public water supply well that supplies 25% of the water to South Berwick, has been in service for 30 years, is designed to be in service for the next 100 years, assuming it doesn't get contaminated. I think that is a game changer for this particular situation. Um, the literature does say that triple wall tanks are available. They are designed, they are provided specifically for aquifers of concern, lakes and streams, uh, particular situations. And, you know, I'm sure there's a case-by-case -case situation that you can argue. And again, we haven't done, any, we haven't taken the lead to do the research. Um, and again, the applicant was gonna look at the cost delta. Um, I think that was a good question that we came up with, you know. Uh, so would you, would you think that, that a triple wall tank would be more appropriate in that 1,500 to 3,000 foot range than 3,700 feet? And that's a good question. I, I guess the, the unknown question that nobody has been able to answer yeah. is how much more, how much safer are the triple wall tanks versus the double wall tanks? Well, one and if they were that much, one would third. they? It's about a third. Oh, maybe, right? I'm just but not a maybe, mathematician, but I'm going to say one third. But that may not be the case. I mean, because right. if, if, you know, what if it's an earthquake that ruptures the second wall tank? Would it do the same to a third? Yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of different yeah, we ways can't play you can. The you, you, but. Right. I think the the in the simplistic terms, if you have you know, if you got two barriers of protection, it's better than one. In the case of the double wall, you got you got you got belts and suspenders. The triple wall, you got belts and suspenders and another set of suspenders, right? Um, it just reduces the odds um, or reduces the risk. How do you quantify that? Again, it's more of just, you know. I, I, think, I think you would have to look at the ratio of how many tanks are installed to how many leaks they have over what period of time for each, the double wall and the triple wall, then. Yeah, again, I, I think that type of analysis is probably beyond any anything that we, any of us would want to get into at this point, but I think it's just a matter of just, you know, I think it would be prudent because it, it is an option that, that was in their literature that they provided. Um, and it seemed to me to make sense to to explore that as a condition to minimize the risk here with this site. So I, just, I just don't see a, a blanket response of it's got to be better, so let's do it. Versus if you had data to say that here's why we should do a triple wall tank versus a double wall tank, 
And, the, and so then the final question is, I did notice in here that, he, you know, Mr. Patel, which I think is reasonable, said that he would be willing to put a triple wall tank in if South Park Water District were willing to shoulder that additional cost. Doesn't is that, that a possibility? That anyone. If anyone shelters that cost. Oh, that's pointed to the town? Yeah. <laughs> James. So I just want to point out, just uh, Terry's done a bunch of research and she's made some calls. Um, so she's talked to some um, contractors and um, in in the field, and um, let, we'll, we'll just do some more research into it and try to get some responses and the efficacy yeah. of double yeah, wall versus triple wall. I'd like to see what main DEP says about that. Well, well that's, I think, I think that's know what the, they say. That's listed in yeah. three of these three of these items, and I think that's our biggest outlier is hearing back from uh, the DEP rep. Is what her opinion is on right, the that's matter. The, that, that's, that's a huge water, piece for right? all of us. Is that yeah. supposed to be yeah. DEP? This is DWP? Or DWP, sorry, drinking, drinking water. water. Yeah, it's drinking program. water program. Yeah, yeah. DWP, yeah. sorry. So it seems like there's always a battle <clears throat> of we want to protect the drinking water, we yeah. want to protect the people who drink the water, but it costs a lot of money to do a lot of the stuff that it's going to take to really protect them. And where are, how far are we willing to go to say that safe drinking water <coughs> is more important than dollars? What's an acceptable risk? Correct. So I know it sounds like the, and correct me if I'm wrong, the hydrogeological study would give you much more information on the area, but that's a really expensive ask. Is that right. Correct. So the triple wall tank it sounds like, is a, a lower cost, but at least a step in the right direction right. for safety. But you want them to pay for it, you're not willing to differentiate the cost from a double to a triple. Well, I would say... Not you. Well, not you. I'm, not, I'm, I'm looking, at, <laughs> looking at you, we but I guess... We want to know what it is. Pardon me? We want to know what that delta is. Okay, so we need to know that number. We need to know the number. Okay. Okay. And we might be able to get a grant. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's where I was kind of going, is there's got to be a solution in here, certainly because the applicant said, yeah, we're not opposed to one. We just got to get the funding. And, and, I, and I would like to see some type of data that says why a triple wall tank is better and, and why why don't people use them. Right. Because to me it or strikes me. What people, application are they being used? Right. If people aren't using them commonly, then it says to me that they're not, they're not enough better to warrant the additional cost. Especially since we are. I, I certainly think there's some information that are to, to collect in that area. Yes. Yeah. Sounds like we all do. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. So hopefully when we meet again we can uh, <laughs> we can have some better info. Is somebody taking notes on what but we're then they'll have quad tanks. I mean specifically <laughs> <laughs> she's been typing away yeah. feverishly. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new business for us, Rick. Yeah. yeah. Quad tanks. I'm gonna make them. Yep. <laughs> Out of wood. Out of wood. Old school. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done with me? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank I, you I think, very right? much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, sir. So in summary, he was good with everything except the double the triple or triple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then they're going to find out about the, cost. the wells. The number of wells, wells, right. Something that it costs. And it. the policy for yeah. monitoring or whatever. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I, th I think that that's just a, that's going to be a DEP standard. There's got to be something. But they'll put, it, they'll put right. it in here. Right. right. That's, that's right. what we need to know. Just so we want to tie this all together and yeah. have it for the record. Because the way I see it, from what we've discussed uh, with, with Condition 1 or Article 1 from their document, um, they're still waiting to hear from the uh, Department of Water, Ms. Susan Bro, for that, for Article 1. By their own admission, they're waiting on that. Article 5, um, again, she has mentioned in there, waiting uh, some information from Susan Bro. And where do you see that one? Right here. Uh, As formally requested that we send them our standard operating procedure. So they're waiting on uh, feedback from our 
No, I don't, I don't think we're waiting on anything there. I think we're not. Okay. No, because it says applicant is working on procuring the documentation. I, I think when we landed on that, so that's a DEP okay. requirement. That's right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's I fair. think so. Yeah, main DEP. Yep, so the only other one is item number six, awaiting the uh, DEP regarding the timeliness report availability. Number four. No, I think we landed on all of the DEP test wells on that one too. Did right. we land on that yeah. as well? So okay. these two right here are okay. DEP regulations. Okay. Yeah. Standard is there. No sense for redundancy. Okay. No, nope. yeah. that makes sense. So for Article One, just waiting on an opinion from Susan Bro. Yeah. Before we can make a decision on that. And then the number of wells, whatever that procedure thing. Is. Yep. Okay. Because it's built in, outlined in here, and they won't get their permit. I think that would be a good, uh, you know, Susan, Susan Bro, if she can, in a timely manner, right. you know, talk to me and DEP and say, why do you guys recommend a double wall tank? Mm -hmm. Correct. No. Yeah. Okay. Could I make a 10-second <coughs> rebuttal on behalf of the applicant? Of course, sir. The Brian Barrington Coolidge Law Firm. This was installed in 1989 in Utah, so 27 years, meaning the leak happened in 2016. And according to the Utah Sur Geological Association, Utah has 700 earthquakes a year. Maine has four quakes every 10 to 15 years. <coughs> and if you think of something in the ground, if you know fiberglass, it's the earthquakes that's gonna cause a leak out of Maine. Thank you, sir. That was, that was good information. Yeah. All right. So we've had a lot, of, a lot of, to say on all of this. Where does that leave us? Well, we're now waiting on, I guess, two questions. One being about the triple wall tank. The cost. The cost. cost. And then. I think that was it. No, the what um, Jerry was saying was about the um, the standards for the testing, the for testing of the wells. The wells, Any wells yeah. Be there and all that. yeah. I just want to make sure. Yes, I wanted to put two in, and we find out a year later that oh, there should. Yeah, be so three we're just here. looking for you to add the standards, the DEP standards of uh, how that well gets tested. Testing. Yeah. So wellhead testing standards. Right. Yep. I, I personally like to applaud you guys though for for your progress thus far I, I think it's a, a great good faith gesture sir um, and your team um, specifically um, for going the, the night operations I mean that definitely it, it said it says a lot to me and it alleviates some worry um, but I definitely want to see more info on, on the water experts what, what they're feedback is but I thank you for for making those concessions because it, it does mean a lot yes so it's so it's really two items right two action items one is to include the DEP standards in the plan for the wellhead for the testing. wellheads testing for the wellheads right mm -hmm. and more information on the difference between double wall and triple wall tanks all and right. then just all your updating on your engineering plans and yeah no I mean you got well, nothing else going on so yeah no just do it on the yeah, I, know, I know that we've been here for a long time but you know um, I guess my question would be right is, is is are we really just down to the two items for the next meeting that to, plus all the updates. And to be clear, these two items are both funneling into the same Berwick Town requirement. So yeah, I think that as far as, as at least as far as we've heard from town admin, those were the only outstanding items. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. My only question would be, do you want to do you want to reconvene June sixth or June twentieth? I mean, six will come up here. quickly, but you know. I think it would. So I think that's kind of dependent on their information. Dependent you know, on the when they get the info. Yeah. So that's probably something you can maybe coordinate with Terry. Terry, if you're ready to go, can. then maybe schedule it for the sixth, and then if they're not ready, we can push it to the twentieth. Yeah. Does that sound sure? Okay. Is it because the one is easy putting the putting the DP standards? Either one, we can we can figure out. So it's getting the cost of the tank. Getting on the a tanks. response on the tanks. Yeah. Who knows? How Maybe not if we get to the conditions and findings and stuff. Yeah, you never know. Well, sometimes it takes yeah. a month and a half. Sometimes it takes four months. So. 
Also, you know, if I can mention it, uh, I think we would be remiss if we didn't thank the people, our friends from South Berwick, for jumping in and staying on this with with this situation and giving us their point of view on all this. I think that's very helpful to us. And I, I also do personally, I want to thank South Berwick Water District, John, Ryan, Dan, all of your company. You guys have been you know you we have i know it's difficult but we you know we are compromising on some of these things and you know i appreciate the it's willingness i appreciate that yes sir okay. all right that all for tonight okay. all right thank you all yeah come on in. at the last planning board meeting the plan Sorry, board asked the water district to work yeah, with main water company yeah, your name. oh john leach self work water <laughs> Um, at the end of the last meeting, the planning board asked the South. Meeting. You were here the last meeting. The last meeting that we addressed this issue. Okay, so that was two oh. meetings ago. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. Just trying to get it straight for the. <laughs> the planning board asked the water district to work with Maine Water Company to see what Maine Water Company would do in this situation. Right. I think it is important to add to the record what Maine Water Company said in their response to your request. I think all of you have seen the report, yeah. Yeah. and Maine Water Company said that they would not allow this in their, um, if, in their territory. That speaks a lot to what we're up against. Um, I just said that because I think it's important to point it out. Um, we did look at what you wanted. They came back and gave us their recommendation, and I think it should speak volumes to what we're up against. Thank you. So, John, what, yeah. what, what you're saying then is that uh, aside from all the negotiations and the back and forth, the preference of South Berwick is not to have this Correct. gas station. Correct. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So, moving along, uh, public comment for non agenda items. Okay, uh, seeing no one move forward. Informational items. Um, open space plan has a page on the town website. There's a ton of information on there. Michaela's doing an awesome job. So anyone that wants to follow along with the process or be part of it, um, check it out. There's gonna be many opportunities to participate in the process. Thank you. That's it. Um, I'll just bring out the vote that's coming June 11th. 11th. Uh, I know the select board also com commented on that last time, so I just wanted to reiterate. Please vote. It's very important that everyone in the, in the town votes, has a say. Yeah, there's land use ordinance amendments on there. Yep. Yeah. Among budget issues and other stuff. So now is that time to vote. Thank you. Vote early, vote off as well. Thank you, sir. Vote early, vote off. I think so. Thank you. If there are no further items for consideration this evening from the esteemed Burgess meeting room in the depths of the Berwick Town Hall, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, good night.